Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, very happy to be here. Um, sorry also um, if this is a bit last moment. Uh, you have been all very accommodating, uh, in making it uh, fitting it into my busy shed schedule. So let's dive right in. Uh, my name is Sebastian Mastorovich, and today I'm presenting on the um, grassroots initiative that I co founded, which is called Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, or SUCHO. And uh, just a bit about myself, um, I'm an IT consultant for digital humanities and I'm currently working in Vienna. Um, I'm one of three Sucho co-founders. Um, the other ones are Anna Kias from Tufts University and uh, Quinn Dombrowski from Stanford. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate in history at the European University Institute. And I studied history film and East European studies in London. So I'm especially happy to be in an event like that where, you know, audiovisual sources are also at the front. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, you can do that on um, at, under the handle Story Tracer. Um, and the rest of my work you can see uh, at storytracer.org as well. So what is Sucho? Um, Sucho is a global grassroots initiative of more than 1,500 volunteers. Um, which generally speaking now um, supports the digital preservation of Ukrainian cultural heritage. Um, we started only with web archiving. This is how Sucho was created. So um, we have archived over 5,000 websites so far um, that contain the already digitized public collections of cultural institutions such as museums, uh, archives or um, other cultural places. Um, that amounts to over 50 terabyte of web archives that we have created. Um, and um, now that, um, you know, we also uh, see the need for more digitization on the ground of materials that are not digitized yet, we have raised over 200,000 euros to buy digitization equipment for Ukrainian institutions. Um, we consist mostly of librarians, archivists, uh, humanities researchers and uh, researchers and technologists, but it's really an open grassroots collective. So, you know, we have people from all walks of life in there. Um, if you want to find out about our work, you can visit our website, uh, sucho.org. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter um, um, under the handle sucho.org. Um, and if you uh, would like to cooperate or volunteer, um, you can reach the three co-organizers, that's me, Anna and Quinn, at info at sucho.org. So what is this talk going to be about? Um, it will have two parts. Uh, the first part will be a bit longer, the second part a bit shorter. Um, and in the first part, I'm going to talk mainly about the direct Sucho missions, um, the mission we have to help Ukrainian cultural institutions. Uh, I will talk about the various projects that we are doing, uh, the web archives I have already mentioned, uh, but also about the Sucho gallery, um, the Sucho meme wall, uh, our wiki and the equipment fund. Um, and while I'm doing that, uh, I will also try to, um, you know, tell a bit the story of how we did manage to collaborate remotely with so many volunteers. Um, and then the second part will be on a more abstract level, uh, I will try to reflect a bit on the lessons we could perhaps learn from Sucho. Um, number one that's been on my mind especially is um, how you can enable more of such remote grassroots collaboration, which tools, uh, which techniques, uh, which approaches are needed to do that. Um, and then also which dangers exist for digital cultural heritage that might not so be at the front of everyone's mind. Um, and then in order to mitigate that, um, how could institutions collaborate better to protect digital cultural heritage? So, but I'll start with the web archives and um, the web archives, um, I would like to uh, point out uh, that idea started all on Twitter. So on uh, two days after the um, first day of the invasion, um, Anna, who had never met before, um, posted a tweet um, asking for a virtual data rescue session. Um, Anna is a musicologist and music librarian. 
Um, and so because there was a conference at the end of the week of uh, musicologists, uh, she tried to gather some people and discuss um, how they could um, help rescue uh, music collections from Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage institutions, digitized collections. Um, Anna has been involved with in data rescue efforts before. I had never heard of that, um, but I saw that tweet and I commented on it. And so because uh, in the weeks before I had been working uh, with a uh, web archiving suite, uh, open source tool suite that's called Web Recorder, I suggested that that might be uh, a tool to not only capture music collections, but um, cultural heritage uh, collections that are digitized in general. Um, I made that comment and, uh, you know, tried to go to sleep, but really couldn't um, because it was kind of haunting my mind that maybe at the end of the week there was nothing left to save. You know, maybe the server would be down or all of Ukraine would be occupied. So I started trying to, you know, look for Ukrainian digital collections and trying to web archive them with Web Recorder. Um, and then the next day, um, I asked um, the entire Twitter community of digital humanists and cultural heritage professionals that I was connected to, um, to submit links to a Google form of all the digital connections that we knew, uh, that they knew, so we could start, you know, trying to download them. Um, and that got quite a bit of a response and people really submit, started submitting thousands of links. And I mean, the growth in kind of reaction um, from, from the entire community was really exponential. So by day two, we already had 400 volunteers. Um, and by the end of a week, we were a thousand. Um, so it all escalated quite quickly, um, I would say. And to give you an idea of, of why and, uh, and that was necessary and, um, uh, which websites we were trying to save, what we were focusing on. I would like to give you a personal example of a website that I uh, crawled, uh, which is the State Archives of Kharkiv, um, which um, I picked from the list that people submitted, um, and I tried to archive it with Web Recorder. What you see right there on the screen is the Web Archive. Um, I discovered that it had 100 gigabytes of data, um, files uh, documenting uh, criminal cases during the Stalinist time, literally court cases um, of people being sent to the Gulag or being shot, uh, other files documenting the Holodomor. Um, and this is just a WordPress website with uploaded PDFs. But obviously, this is very extremely valuable uh, cultural heritage. Um, so on the morning of the 3rd of March, I finish, finished my crawl. Uh, downloaded these 100 gigabytes and then it was a kind of dramatic situation because by the end of the day at 5 p.m the website was offline and um, then we unfortunately got um, footage sent to us which shows um, how the state archive of Kharkiv was shelled and I've only learned this week unfortunately that actually one of their buildings is completely destroyed. Now this website has come back online uh, just a few months ago, and that really gives me a lot of hope. Um, but for m several months, we just didn't know why it was offline, and we kept the copy um, just to safeguard it. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case for all the websites. Um, what you see here is the website of the uh, Regional Library of, of Kherson, which I guess you all know um, has been occupied by Russian troops uh, um, for several months now. Um, and it, it contains equally important data, for example, catalogs from the library itself, um, you know, from 1874. Um, unfortunately, this website is down and we don't quite know why, because if you, this, what you're looking at is the web archive, but if you uh, look at the original URL, you will see that it says account suspended. And as we progressed with doing our web archives, uh, we really discovered different risk scenarios. And so we, we are not quite sure why this account is suspended uh, from a web hoster. You know, the web hosting account has been suspended. It could be that occupy, occupation authorities shut it down, but it could also be that the person that was supposed to take care of payments for this web hosting account 
the cis admin, let's say, um, isn't able to take care of it anymore for a number of variety of reasons. Um, they could be fighting at the front, they could be fleeing, or there could also be, you know, um, much worse scenarios that I don't want to imagine. Um, but that gave us a, a kind of um, sense that it is not enough to, you know, try to archive things that have, for example, a Ukrainian domain name or things that we found out were hosted in uh, Germany, example, and other places abroad. Uh, we really needed to download as much as possible. We couldn't know beforehand which things could be at risk for which reasons. So I'd like to talk a bit about the tools that we've been using um, to, on one hand, um, create these web archives, but then on the other hand, to collaborate as well as a grassroots initiative. Um, so our first um, stop has always been the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive. Um, any um, website that uh, we discovered or that was sent to us by volunteers, uh, we have submitted to the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive. Um, but we quickly discovered, and this might be interesting uh, for a lot of you who work with um, audiovisual collections, that the Wayback Machine and the crawler that is behind it, which is called Heritrix, um, which many national libraries and big institutions use, um, sometimes has trouble with uh, the way websites are coded today and also um, the, the, the way they are structured. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, technically how the Heritrix crawler works is that it looks at the HTML code and looks for links, you know, pointing to different parts of the site. But today, websites can be highly user interactive and also um, based on uh, loading things on demand. Um, so that the only thing that the Wayback Machine crawler sees when it opens a website is actually a script, which then waits for user interaction for more things to load. And that is the big difference that the tools of the web recorder suite can actually achieve. Um, um, the browser tricks crawler, which is the main component of the web recorder suite, what it does pose to the Wayback Machine is that it actually opens a instance of Google Chrome. It spins up a browser and then opens the website like that and saves anything it sees. So if I could sum it up is that the Wayback Machine behaves more like a robot, but the browser tricks crawler actually emulates a human looking at the website. So what that means is that if you have um, heavily user interactive sites that for example, um, depend um, on uh, modern UX techniques like infinite scrolling, you know, when you, scroll through a website and it keeps loading more data or very important for videos for example that you you know need to click on a video to load it and before that it is invisible to a robot um, the browser trick scholar can achieve these things and um, by emulating human behavior which oh you can also customize it then produces really high fidelity web archives um, that can capture a lot of the things that we care about such as PDFs, uh, MP4s, video files, audio files, all the things that in a sit an emergency situation like this is really the things that we want to save. And another great thing that uh, about the web recorder suite is that it works with a new web archiving format, which is, um, let's say, a further development from the standardized web format that is broadly used now, which is WARC. So uh, what comes out of web recorder is a WAX file, Web Archive Collection zipped. Um, and what's so special about that is that, you know, the, uh, the, the crawls that you make end up in a single file. Actually, you can have several crawls all put together in a single file that you can download and that you can view with the viewer, which is called Replay Web Page, even offline, or, uh, you know, you could put it on a USB drive and give it someone. So from our perspective, that is really important because it makes it easier to restitute, to potentially restitute web archives. Um, it's an extremely well-formed self-contained format and um, it loads when you put it on a server super efficiently so that uh, 
our biggest web archive, for example, our biggest WAX file is 1.4 terabytes big, uh, but we can load it with Replay web page because it's such good software. Um, it only loads the home page, and as you click further through the web archive, it actually loads the rest of the data, so it keeps um, the the traffic very low. Um, and these were the tools that we might primarily use for web archiving. And to co coordinate between each other, we really use the tools that many of us are familiar with uh, from our work life, uh, especially after the pandemic, remote work tools, namely Slack and Google Sheets. And um, what came out of that then, um, you can kind of see on this slide, which is a, a ginormous master spreadsheet, uh, which we call the, the giant spreadsheet, um, where the main thing that people would do is um, they would claim a website. They would take personal responsibility for trying to crawl that website. And this spreadsheet has around 20 tabs and several thousand rows, but it worked surprisingly well. Um, and it also allowed us to really uh, have a super low threshold of people to collaborate. Every, almost everyone has a Google account. Everybody can instantly start working. Um, and on the right, you see some of the uh, extremely professional task forces then emerged from trying to solve some of the more complicated problems that actually emerge uh, when you try to do something like that. So now we have a lot of task forces that, for example, do scraping for repository uh, websites uh, like DSpace, for example, the situation monitoring team, there was a domain discovery team or a Wikidata team. But that worked really well because people were used to these tools. Um, and what emerged from that then is, as one of our volunteers uh, has called it quite aptly, um, a sort of digital Dunkirk. So uh, the crawling was actually done at the beginning on the volunteers' devices because it doesn't take much power to do web crawling. It just needs a lot of parallelization. A lot of people need to do it at the, uh, at the same time to try to win this race against time that we were you know, uh, racing. Um, so we had people, for example, at MIT um, getting an army of Raspberry Pi as its task, and people would um, install um, Docker for the first time, which is the software you need to run our scripts. Um, and then they would run out of disk space on their personal computers and start uninstalling games to make more space for web archives. That was quite amazing to see. Um, Later on, uh, we also got um, uh, some donated cloud server capacity, which allowed us to spin up the cloud instance of Browser Tricks. The developer of um, uh, Web Recorder, Ilya Kramer, is part of our team. And uh, he had just announced his plans for Browser Tricks Cloud, which runs on Kubernetes, but uh, it was in no shape or form ready. Um, but he just said, okay, let's do the alpha, alpha, alpha version. And what you see here is then that all it takes for a volunteer um, is to actually enter a URL and click start. And then you can actually see in the cloud version, the computer saving the website, seeing what the computer sees as it, webs uh, as it, as it tries to save the website. Um, and that really allowed us to scale up and involve people that are also not necessarily hyper-technical. So for example, my um, co-founder Quinn then uh, recruited her son to do a lot of web archiving, her eight-year-old son, Sam. Um, and then together with Sam, they trained his school class, uh, the Malcolm X uh, Elementary School in California. Um, so we really able through this uh, deployment of a self-hosted software as a service uh, to give a lot of people a leg up uh, where, you know, coding or using the command line might have been um, an, a barrier. But that has been phase one of web archiving, and uh, we have extended into doing more things. So now uh, for phase two, we have the slogan, uh, curate, donate, educate, because as we were receiving feedback from Ukraine, um, it was clear that web archiving is not enough to help in this emergency situation. So the feedback that we got from a meeting with 300 cultural professionals was that, first of all, it was really important for them to raise awareness for cultural heritage by exhibiting online. Very important as well to get equipment uh, for digitization hardware for materials that are not digitized yet. 
and support train and training in digitization, metadata and curation methods, um, which a lot of people need that are eager to digitize to protect their collections, but they might not have the, the training um, as in other institutions. Um, also digital preservation platforms. So where do you upload something once it has been digitized is a really great need. So um, as a response to this, we created the Suture Equipment Fund um, to buy equipment, digitization equipment for Ukrainian institutions. And um, it's a separate transparent budget from our operational budget where we pay our server costs from. Um, and we try to um, buy equipment as much as possible from the Ukrainian market. It's a very complicated thing because we are all librarians, archivists, historians. We have very little experience with that, but we have plans how we hope to uh, make this possible in a, in a, on a bigger scale. Um, if that's something you'd like to, to contribute to, um, you can find the donation button on our website. And we can also now um, enable tax deductible donations for institutions that might have that requirement that uh, pay, uh, donations might be need to be tax deductible. Um, this was our first delivery to the Vernatsky National Library. Um, Amazon Web Services and Amazon were very generous and uh, uh, donated very, several hundred devices because they really needed everything. Um, but we would like to reach a lot more smaller institutions. Um, so one of the places that we are trying to cooperate with now, and this might be very interesting for you as well, as um, you know, people who work with audiovisual stuff is the Center for Urban History in Beef. Uh, we want to explore whether they can help us distribute equipment and give advice to a smaller institutions um, across Ukraine, especially in the east of Ukraine, how they can digitize. And they themselves also need equipment. Uh, they are actually, uh, they have created the Urban Media Archive, which is the leading audiovisual collection in Ukraine. And they have received materials uh, from Mariupol, which has been completely destroyed. And they now really need a professional film scanner um, to, to scan those uh, audiovisual materials. Um, they also need further support with software, training, and also proposal writing, because it's a very stressful thing to do in a war situation. There might be funds out there, but you know, the experts in proposal writing, it would be great if people from the audiovisual space um, could, could offer the help uh, for the urban media archive. Uh, maybe there is a film scanner, um, a used one that uh, someone could provide or could be bought cheaply using Sucho funds. I just want to put it out there because I think this is a fitting um, venue to, to mention this. So what we have created um, um, as a response to the uh, feedback from Ukraine is also the Sucho Gallery. Um, which acts as a first upload platform. Right now, we are only curating it with items from the web archives, um, but it's supposed to be an um, exhibition space. It's based on Omica, uh, where people, where uh, institutions present their collection, upload directly, and if they have no prior metadata experience, enter basic metadata um, that already uh, describes the items well. Um, there's also the Sucho meme wall, which is getting quite a lot of traction now, which is a completely separate team of people collecting Ukrainian war memes. Um, and this is already used in a class at Taras Shevchenko University in Kyiv. Um, and it's really a really impressive thing that I hadn't in no way or shape or form thought of as cultural heritage before. But of course, it's the most immediate, immediate form of dealing with the war. So it de definitely deserves archiving as well. And the plan is that you know, some of the methods that we have used, but also the methods uh, of digitization that Ukrainians will uh, compile can be gathered in the Sucho Wiki so that a lot of people can work on writing tutorials and doing um, video courses and so on. We want to gather this set of learning resources there. So um, just a tiny bit about what uh, I think could be learned from the experience of Sucho. Don't want to take too long and also leave some space for questions, so I'll hurry up. Um, but I really think that um, we have some valuable insights now about how you can facilitate more grassroots collaboration online. Because grassroots collaboration 
can take many shapes uh, and is also needed in a lot of different areas. You need it in volunteer initiatives like ours, uh, but there also needs to be a way for activists to organize online. Um, but it doesn't have to be political as well. If you think about research across institutions, um, they, they have an equal problem of you know, trying to uh, organize and do things digitally um, uh, if they don't have the tools uh, available by the institutions. And the stumbling blocks to really doing grassroots collaboration online that I have identified is on one hand that the commercial tools, the remote collaboration tools such as Slack, uh, Airtable or Notion um, have very high prices if you want to use the features that are really useful. So, you know, it ranges around 10 euros, $10 a user usually. And that is in no shape or form possible for just a bunch of people who want to do things together. On the other hand, if you are at a research institution and you might have some collaboration tools, these are not usually accessible to outside external collaborators. You know, you are locked in into very cool tools, but they can only be used by members of certain institutions or consortia. Um, and then there's a lesson as well about digital community empowerment. It was really important to us, you know, to, uh, to learn that you need to meet people where they are um, and to be aware of people's digital literacy. And in response to that, make really good self-learning resources. So uh, making good tutorials, online workshops. Anna at the beginning did, as far as I remember, three live Zoom workshops a day to get people rolling. Um, and this effort, this grit, this investment in volunteers is really needed if you want them um, to, to contribute to, to such a complicated task. Uh, then what we found out as well is really important to have familiar tools or user experiences. So even if it's not Slack or Google Sheets, the things, the tools that you're supposed to, that, that, that really uh, give, a, give, a, give a benefit are the tools that are as easy to use as Google Sheets or Slack. And we also, I also think it would be uh, foolish to outright reject proprietary tools at the beginning of remote collaboration. Rather, I would say start with proprietary tools, get going and transition to open source tools when the right time is right. Um, you know, but it's really at the beginning, you cannot have the ideal solution it was a really valuable lesson for us. <clears throat> then I think there's great potential in actually self-hosting some of the open source tools that are out there. Um, I only want to, I don't want to read them out, but here's a list of extremely useful, self-hostable open source tools that are basically clones of commercial tools that are out there. But the catch is that in order for people to use some of these open source tools, someone needs to set them up, maintain them, host them, and give them to strangers for free. It's really hard to start because people cannot host their own service. So I think there's really a need for institutions or nonprofit foundations um, to integrate some of these tools and provide them for people who want to do good civil society work. Um, and uh, there is a huge potential for a lot of <clears throat> good work that needs to be done remotely. Um, and very, very quickly, uh, there are also some ideas about digital cultural heritage protection. Um, really, the lesson is that it doesn't take a war. Uh, digital infrastructure is critical, and uh, there's a multitude of ways uh, cultural heritage data can disappear. Um, it can be man-made disasters, it can be natural disasters, but it can also be ransomware attacks, uh, link in software rot, or just the end of funding. Um, and I, we think that one of the solutions to that might be really informal solutions um, of institutions across the world collaborating, for example, akin to the model of twin cities. I take care of your data, and you take care of my data. Uh, in a very informal, simple way, this is how a library at one of the end of the world could help a library at the other end of the world um, back it up. There are also more sophisticated solutions like backup buttons for aggregators who right now are only aggregating but not saving, um, and also preemptive web archiving, since we have seen that web archiving is a really powerful tool. Um, but I would like to stop there um, and really thank you for your attention. 
and just reiterate once again that you know please help ukraine in every shape form uh, way that's possible because uh, they really need all our all our help at the moment thank you Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. And every question I thought, how have you answered within it? It was brilliant. Um, that said, I wonder if there are any questions in the room today? We have a few hands up. Um, I will how I'll ask you if you can hear it when we uh, when we do the present when we ask the question, but it may be that I have to run back onto stage. Okay. No problem. Oh, okay, thank you. No, it's all right, I have a helper. Thank you. Uh, Steve on as well. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your presentation and for your efforts. Um, I wondered uh, how you cooperate with, and if you cooperate or are supported by Europeana in your efforts. Did you hear? Yes, I, I think I did hear that. So to, to give you dirty secrets, most of these uh, slides are for my talk at Europeana a few uh, weeks ago. So yes, uh, Europeana was one of the first institutions that donated to pay our server costs. And um, I've, I've issued a call at Europeana 22 to really um, for the network to become active now, because what I, what I haven't included in these slides is that we've also been asked to advise for the creation of a digital national library of Ukraine. The Ukrainian Library Association is planning that together with UNESCO and IFLA. And that's something we say really is beyond the scope of Sutro. This is something volunteers cannot do. So, you know, through the Europeana network, I hope that some people can emerge that can take over that task. You know, there is a place for institutions. Um, and, but yeah, Europeana, uh, the entire Europeana team and network have become really good friends already. Hello, uh, Steve. Um, in the presentation, you mentioned that uh, people were volunteering to say, hey, I'm going to scroll that website. Is uh, for each website, is it only one person or you have multiple person? And if you have multi multiple, do you, um, how do you decide which copy is more correct than the other? They might differ. And also because it's so war, you might have actually uh, uh, bad people trying to insert bad data and claim, oh, look, they had this on that website or things like that. How do you uh, deal with that? Okay, uh, I think uh, what I heard is about, you know, what do you do if some, several people claim the website and how do you reconciliate that uh, after the fact? Well, that's a very good question because um, actually the collaboration worked very smooth and very easily. So, for example, it could be that people that can only use browser tricks claim the website, but then ran into some problems. Browser tricks is also not magic, right? In some places it failed miserably. Like I said, uh, there is, for example, DSpace or rep repository websites, which have a weird link structure where it just goes around in loops. Um, or uh, what we found with historical collections is that, for example, you sometimes have a calendar that goes endless into the future or way back into the past. So there's just always the next link. So when a problem like that emerged, someone, they might have asked for help and someone else took over. But generally speaking, if we got a good version, because, because we had a quality control team of Ukrainian speakers who checked, did the essential things get saved? Um, we, we have one or two versions, let's say. Now what's really hard is to even index them and, and make them available with some metadata. And this is what we're doing right now. So we're taking this huge haystack and putting it, uh, we were trying to form a data model uh, to, uh, to, to say, okay, what belongs to which institutions and what does it contain and so on. This is where we are at right now. Um, uh, and there's a smaller group of people working on that. Uh, but the collaboration at the time worked surprisingly smooth. There was not so many clashes, rather people giving each other a hand with different skills. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. We have two, two more questions, maybe more. Hi, uh, Lucy from the BFI. Um, one is more a comment and then a question. Um, so just about your film scanning, just you've probably already done this, but whether you've reached out to like FIAF or EMEA who may have um, organizations who could 
give a film scanner maybe. And then the question is, um, in terms of the websites, like, do you go back to some of the websites to see how they've changed over the months? And if they've changed, do you then kind of recrawl those websites? And um, just that kind of idea, do you, do you do that at all? Like, how often do you kind of recrawl the websites if you do? Um, and are you seeing any changes, especially if it's in um, now unauthorized Russian occupied Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, for the first question, um, no, uh, we haven't reached out to these places yet because the, the conversation with the Center for Urban History only started last week. Um, we have known about them a lot. So I would ask you, I didn't get the acronyms either, um, please to send us an email. Uh, I, I, will, I will remember your question. Could you please tell us these potential partners? That would be great. Um, FIAF and AMIA, I believe. So that's A-M-I-A, -A, AMIA. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, if yeah. someone could send so we will send them to you, yes, absolutely. It <laughs> would be great because uh, I'm new to this world. So like I'm interested, but I'm new. Um, and then the second one, yeah, this is exactly what we need at the moment. So basically, we also just need a, a well-formed index before we can try to uh, ascertain the status of the different websites. Uh, one of our volunteers, a real wizard, uh, Benjamin Schmidt, who is a digital humanities professor from, from New York, in the, sometime in between, made a script that actually tracks all the domains that we do and tracks the status, whether we, they were offline or online. And we think that around, it fluctuated uh, between like five or 10% that uh, websites were going offline or online, but we haven't connected that with our web archives yet. And we can't uh, regularly uh, crawl them yet until we have basically made an authoritative list that is connected to the versions that we already have. There's a lot of sorting and cleaning up to do, and we're trying to finance uh, contracts at different institutions like the Bavarian State Library to U for Ukrainians to do this work as well. So it's not just us working on that data. But first we need a list and uh, uh, an, ab uh, an ability to view what we already have, and then we can try to track this metadata, which is really important, obviously. Wonderful, thank you. We have a question online, I think. No, that's actually from me. Hi, Sebastian. Oh, it's Rasa here from Sound and Vision. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. I would love to learn a bit more about how you collaborate and involve organizations and, and citizens on the ground in Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. especially in curation efforts, kind of helping to identify the, the really high at risk assets uh, or really kind of important assets that may not be so visible, let's say, for other volunteers? That's a really good question. And that's one of the toughest tasks, I have to admit. Um, many of us had never worked with Ukraine before. I don't speak Ukrainian. My co-founders don't speak Ukrainian. We all have a bit of an exposure to, uh, to Eastern Europe, like I speak about our co-founders. Um, but but uh, we, we are really outside of our comfort zone. We don't have pre-existing connections. So this is what we have trying to do over the last few months. And it's a slow process. Um, we have some examples now, like the National Library, and something that we are more focused on, which is smaller institutions that don't get so much publicity. And there we have the Cherkasi Regional Library. We are trying to buy a professional book scanner for now. And they had, out of their own initiative, already fundraised for a smaller scanner and um, and uh, explain to us the things that they want to digitize, which is really enlightening because you don't think about this. So they have made a competition uh, for children's drawings of displaced internal refugee children who process their, 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 their traumatic war experiences um, through, uh, through drawings. And that's the first thing they want to digitize. Uh, then they have 1,400 rare books as well, but they are friends with the Ethnological Museum next door. So they would also like to use the book scanner to scan tactiles, textiles, which is possible. But this is a very slow process. And we realize that it's also too slow when we do it from outside of Ukraine. So this is why we would like to see if a place like the Center for Urban History which knows a lot of the smaller places and has tried to get them to digitize before the war, can do that and we can give them the funds to then 
fulfill the needs of the different smaller institutions because uh, it's a really an expert task and we all do volunteers doing it on the, on the, on the site. So we think, you know, if we can give a Ukrainian institution like this, the resources, I think it would be more efficient. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time, unfortunately. We're three minutes over. But thank you ever so much. And we can have a quick round of applause again for you again. Many, many thanks for coming today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.